Thank you, Michael and Benchling, for setting us up, and welcome to all of you. I'm going to share my screen. All right. So yesterday in one of the workshops, Nigel Green from AstraZeneca used the quote that I'm sure you've all heard. AI will not replace scientists, but the scientists who use AI will replace those who don't. We're going to dig into that a little bit today. We're going to talk about um, when we envision the future of precision medicine, what role does human computation and human in the loop AI have to play? And how can games like Philo and um, Foldit and Stall Catchers make real medical progress? So helping me with that today is our panel. We've got Pietro Michelucci with the Human Computation Institute, Seth Cooper with Northeastern University, Lee Lancaster with Cohen Veterans Bioscience, and Jerome Vesterpool with McGill University. Each of our speakers is going to introduce himself and give you a little background before we join together for a Q&A. If you are watching this in Pathable, you'll see a chat panel on your right. You can chat us questions there. Um, in the second tab of that panel, we also have a poll, so I encourage you to go there and take the poll. If you're watching this in the Zoom app, you can also send us questions through the ch um, chat panel there. We're going to be consolidating questions from both apps, so we'll get to them all. If you are in Zoom, I encourage you to go back to the browser quickly and take our poll so we have everyone's um, participation. So assuming you've all done that, um, I'm going to let Pietro kick us off. Pietro? Okay, hello. This is uh, this is Pietro Michelucci here. It looks like we're, <clears throat> we're working through some zoom related glitches uh so i'm just gonna gonna try to get started here um with with our first talk i i'm at the human computation institute based in ithaca new york where um we study uh systems uh that combine human and machine information processing uh often uh in online distributed uh kinds of platforms um so um uh so I'm here to talk about why machines by themselves um, cannot yet tackle precision uh, medicine. Um, so, um, um, so you know, COVID uh, nineteen uh, it's pretty scary stuff, um, and it was certainly scary back in February when we still called it the Wuhan virus, uh, if you remember uh, those days. And this is my uh, sixteen-year-old son, Luca. Uh, so Luca came home from school, uh, this was back in February, worried that he'd been exposed to Wuhan. Um, his friend's mother had just returned from China and I think had some, some symptoms. And I said, no, I, you know, I think that's really, really unlikely. And then four days later, uh, he started to have symptoms. Um, fortunately, uh, it turned out to be influenza B. And Luca you know, recovered quickly from the flu. But like many people, he's still pretty freaked out about COVID-19. And so, you know, he asked me about it. He said, hey, dad, doesn't coronavirus have a 3% mortality rate? Um, so I tried to calm him by explaining that averages don't apply to individuals. You know, if you're not in a vulnerable population and you don't have other diseases, your mortality risk is probably much lower. And then Luca reminded me that there had been young, healthy people um, that had already died from the, uh, this virus, uh, like the, like the uh, physician who first reported it. So I, I said somewhat dismissively, well, you know, that's probably unusual. Um, and he didn't seem too satisfied with that answer. Uh, and frankly, I wasn't either. So why are some people harder than others? And why do some respond better to certain treatments than others? Um, so these are, of course, the fundamental questions of precision medicine. You know, the idea that each person is a unique case study, an experiment with an N of one. Um, so with, you know, with HIV, um, we eventually realized that the Russians and Scandinavians who seemed to be immune were all homozygous for the CCR5 Delta 32 mutation. Um, and, and this was transformative for treatment development. But researchers, um, the HIV researchers, had some big clues about you know, where to look when they made this discovery. But when we don't have those kinds of waypoints, there are just too many possible factors. And then the problem becomes very complex. So nowadays, we turn to artificial intelligence to help us with problems like precision medicine, where we have lots of variables and we're trying to find useful patterns. You know, but here's the truth. 
Today's artificial intelligence is not ready to solve the challenges of, preci of precision medicine, um, at least not by itself. But let's imagine what might happen if we tried to use AI for this. Um, so let's collect everything we know about all the coronavirus patients, their histories, their family histories, comorbidities, phenotypes, uh, genomics, biomics, proteomics, all the omics, and of course, uh, make sure to include outcomes. And then let's throw it all into a big AI grinder, turn the crank, and see what the magical pattern it discovers is. Um, problem solved, right? We're done. Um, so, so not quite so fast. So the problem is we're dealing um, with messy data, and that's far worse than big data. So big data has come to mean a lot of things. You know, I think there's a, a new Starbucks size, you know, Grande, Venti, and then, and then big data. But I want to talk about messy data. So messy data is all the stuff we're throwing in the grinder. You know, it means we're combining apples and oranges. The data is multi-source, it's heterogeneous, um, and it's very, very multidimensional. Um, so why is that a problem? I mean, it's AI after all. Um, the problem is there are too many possible combinations of variables to explore, more than there are particles in the known universe. So we have two choices. We can either drastically limit which patterns are explored, or we can just let the system discover an endless list of patterns. Um, so, so let's continue with our thought experiment. Let's say we have complete data on 100,000 coronavirus patients and a 1% mortality rate. So 1,000 of those people are hospitalized, were hospitalized and died. And we want to include all the variables so we keep no stones unturned. We want to find out what is so special about these patients that makes them vulnerable. So we throw all our data into our AI grinder. And can anyone guess what happens next? We find a pattern. Um, we discover that every single one of those 1,000 people has a mother whose name starts with the letter J and farts in the middle of the night. So, you know, we, we better go rush over and tell all the ED doctors so they can add this to their triage, right? So we're also going to discover a billion other patterns common among these 1,000 coronavirus victims. But almost all of them will be spurious, you know, just purely coincidental. So how do we winnow it down into the ones that are not just coincidental correlations, but are actually causal and actionable? You know, on the other hand, should we really throw everything into this grinder. But who decides what goes in and how do we know when something important comes out? So a colleague recently told me a story about how an AI system revealed a compound found in a study population of ALS patients. Initially, the researchers thought it might be a, a major discovery to causes and treatments of ALS. Until my colleague remembered that the compound was a Tylenol metabolite and recalled from his real world clinical experience that Tylenol is used extensively by ALS patients. So it took an expert to realize the finding was indeed a non-random random pattern, but not a helpful one. In other words, machines can discover patterns, but it takes a human to understand what a pattern means and when it's important. You know, but why? You know, why can't machines do this too? Um, so humans think differently. Um, I like to use the left brain, brain right brain metaphor um, that a lot of people are familiar with. So when it comes to left brain sort of symbolic thinking, computers are extremely reliable and quick. They also remember things very well. Humans, on the other hand, are awful at things like arithmetic and logic. So, you know, we're, we're mostly like the right brain in this left right brain paradigm. And our brains were designed by millions of years of evolution to use intuition to solve messy problems, problems that require modeling complex inter interdependent systems. But there's a catch. So this right-brained approach takes shortcuts. It sometimes misses things or, manif or manifests different forms of bias. And symbolic reasoning is really hard to do with neural networks. You know, we aren't made for that and, and being neural networks ourselves and artificial neural networks aren't made for symbolic reasoning. Um, and, and you know, I think the main reason it involved in humans was so we can do, you know, we, we can have language, uh, which, which our symbolic reasoning helps with. So, so this is why we invented calculators, right, to cheat. You know, we're so poor at symbolic computation, we need help. So we created a computer that was designed and specialized to fill this specific gap. 
But what if we could get these simple calculators to think more like people do? You know, then we could start to automate human-like thinking, maybe even make it think like humans, but even smarter. You know, then we'd all be out of work. I, I mean, then we could automatically solve lots of problems. And, you know, AI researchers are definitely working very hard on this, but we're not there yet. And these last few things on the AI timeline are the hardest nuts to crack. So for example, let's take abstraction, you know, recognizing patterns of patterns. So a plumber was watching a YouTube video about how to get a cork out when it's been pushed inside a bottle. Um, and I think the idea was you, you insert a, a plastic bag and you inflate it. Um, so he saw a parallel to a similar problem in obstetrics when babies are stuck in the birth canal and had an idea to use the same kind of approach you know, to help. And he shopped his idea around to obstetricians and eventually one of them you know, pursued the idea and it's an FDA approved product today. But imagine trying to get a machine to come up with that idea. You know, humans still far exceed machines in linking patterns across abstraction levels and domains. So AI isn't there yet, but maybe we can return the favor. So remember the student who used the calculator to cheat? What if we could let AI cheat by sneaking a human in the room to help out? You know, and that's what we're actually doing today. We find ways to insert uniquely human cognitive abilities into the AI loop where they are needed. In fact, we're building systems that effectively combine the respective strengths of humans and machines to solve problems that couldn't otherwise be solved. So for example, at the Human Computation Institute, we created an online game that anyone can play called Stall Catchers. And in Stall Catchers, uh, players look through this virtual microscope um, at blood flow uh, movies in a mouse brain um, to try to decide whether the blood flowing through the outlined capillary is flowing or stalled. You know, it's a simple two choice uh, task. Uh, and this helps advance uh, and accelerate the Alzheimer's research. But although this task is very similar in, or simple in concept, it's sometimes very hard to tell whether a blood vessel is flowing or stalled for lots of reasons. Uh, for example, we have noisy images. Sometimes we get overexposed images. Um, so this is an example of where the real world knowledge that humans bring to the task give humans an edge over AI. So, so before we started this project, the problem was that machine learning systems could only get about 85% of these right. And that's why we needed to bring humans in. And, and one of the reasons why humans can do better is they can look at context. So anyone who's played with a garden hose as a child knows that if water's coming out of one end of the hose, it must be going in the other end of the hose. So even if you're paying attention to what's happening inside this outline, to see whether or not a blood vessel is flowing or stalled. When the vessel's overexposed, you might have to look at the context around that outlined area and know something about fluid dynamics and how that works. And that's just something we naturally understand and can bring to the problem that doesn't exist in the pixels themselves, which is what the machine learning systems are looking at. Um, so um, when we were starting the Stall Catchers project, trying to get it started, I brought this idea um, to um, at the NIH National Alzheimer's Summit, summit and uh, it was well received and I was encouraged to, to pursue it with, uh, with NIH support. Um, but um, uh, there, was, there was skepticism at first um, among the, the reviewers. So, you know, most people don't parade their grant rejections. Um, but since I know how this story ends, I kind of like to show this one. So, um, you know, at the time, and still to some extent today, the scientific community um, is very skeptical about the use of public volunteers for scientific data analysis. And this reviewer was concerned about exactly that, you know, saying this proposal suggests a way to harness the power of people on the internet to speed analysis but the reliance on untrained individuals with various motivations renders the impact questionable. Um, and ironically, this was the very hypothesis we had proposed to test, uh, whether or not we could trust data analyzed by the public. So, um, so that one didn't work out, but eventually Bright Focus Foundation gave wings to the Stall Catchers project. Um, but how do we actually ensure high quality data when non-expert members of the public are doing the analysis? So um, in this sort of canonical example, uh, at a 1906 country fair in, in Plymouth, England, 800 people were trying to guess the weight of a slaughtered ox. Um, I think this picture, that's not really an ox sitting there, but it, it's sort of representative um, of this kind of state fair contest. 
And uh, a, statistic, a statistician who looked at the data noticed that the median answer among those 800 guesses was within 1% of the correct guess. You know, and this contributed to this, this more general insight that when, the, that when there's a distribution of individual answers from people, the center of the distribution tends to align with the true value. You know, and this is what we call wisdom of crowds. So, you know, in the first few months of stall catchers, we got lots of people involved. And our goal was to analyze the data 10 times as fast as, as the lab while maintaining this very high level of accuracy in our analysis. Whoops. Um, so, um, you know, we were, at first we were only about one and a half times as fast because we were very inefficient. We had to gather answers from 20 different people um, about each vessel in order to come up with a crowd answer that would produce the level of accuracy we needed. And we were using something very similar to the, what I call the OX method, you know, using measures of central tendency like the median or the mean answer. Um, but we realized we needed help from machines to make better use of the human answers. So we improved our wisdom of crowd method. And today it takes only about five people, actually more like four people, um, per crowd answer. And stall catchers is doing analysis five times faster now than the lab with very high accuracy. So even though individual non-expert members of the general public may not analyze data as well as a scientist would, it turns out that when you combine those into a crowd-based answer, you, as we do in stall catchers, then um, the crowd answer is even better than what we find in the lab. And in fact, you know, once we validated stall catchers, you know, early in the days of the project, uh, Cornell, who's doing the Alzheimer's research, decided to give us our first data set for de novo analysis done entirely by stall catchers. And, um, and we were a little nervous, of course, uh, but we delivered the crowdsourced data analysis. Um, and then they told us they'd kept some data aside and done their own in-lab analysis just to kind of as, a, as an extra check. Um, and they were concerned because they discovered some disagreement between the crowd produced results and their own results. So we went and, and we sat down, we looked at all, all, all the actual vessel movies together. And ultimately, in almost every case, they said the crowd was right and, and, um, and the experts even ended up having more agreement with the crowd than with each other. Uh, so this, this was kind of a, a nice vindicating uh, result and, and reinforced our methods. Um, so today, Stall Catchers has uh, about 30,000 players. Um, we're answering new research questions every one to two months. Uh, previously, it would take the lab six months to, to a year. Um, and, um, and, you know, we're publishing uh, these results in top tier journals. We credit the, the players in them as many other uh, projects like ours do. Um, and we're getting closer to a treatment target. Each green check mark here um, is a hypothesis related to mechanistic models leading to the treatment um, that was from some data set analyzed by stall catchers. You know, and the red question marks are the remaining questions to answer uh, toward a treatment target. Um, so, um, stall catchers is in a class of problems where microtasking is used to crowdsource a time-consuming analysis that can only be done by humans. Uh, but there's another class of problems that, that I, I call optimization problems. And, and the Foldit game, like, like stall catchers, which is another so-called citizen science project where volunteers do, do some online activity uh, to help analyze the data, has this, this characteristic where um, people are trying to um, you know, fold molecules to come up to to come up with a better folding, um, and um, so um, uh, Seth Cooper, who will be speaking in a bit, uh, will 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 say a lot more about this project, which is his. Um, but in in the case of Foldit, there there are too many possibilities for computers to evaluate exhaustively. It's kind of like the the grinder problem I was discussing earlier, um, and so you know the 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 humans that that are plugged into this loop, use intuition to narrow the search space. Um, and I think Seth will, will probably talk about some of the results uh, from that project, which are impressive. So AI is not ready to solve the data challenges of precision medicine by itself, but if we can figure out the best way to bring humans into the loop in partnership with AI systems, then we stand a better chance to overcome the analytic challenges posed by precision medicine. So, um, you know, you've seen just a, a couple examples of human AI partnerships that are working today, and you'll, and you'll hear about more soon from, from some of my esteemed co-panelists uh, who have firsthand, uh, you know, knowledge of them. But this, this general approach to problem solving that leverages the respective strengths of humans and machines to solve problems uh, is, is often called human computation. So the question is, how do we develop and tune human computation for precision medicine? 
I mean, maybe we could apply an approach like fold it to get humans to make educated guesses about how to filter what goes into our AI grinder for precision medicine or to evaluate the many patterns that emerge from that. Um, but what kind of investment would it take just to see whether or not that would actually work? So, you know, to this end, we've been building a data science ecosystem that makes it easy to create new human computation systems and then run experiments on sandboxed versions of these. So, for example, before we make any improvements to the live version of the stall catchers game, we can test them out in a controlled environment to see what works best. Um, and since humans and machines think differently, we decided to see if we could figure out whether a human might do better when paired with an AI assistant that makes suggestions to the human, and then the human can decide whether or not to accept those. Um, and our, our toolkit enables experiments to be designed and run without writing any code, and that makes it possible to quickly stand these up and see results live as they trickle in. So, you know, in our first experiment, which we ran in partnership with Microsoft Research, we're seeing preliminary evidence that when paired with an AI assistant that's programmed with a certain response bias, the human combined with the AI working together is actually more accurate than the human or the AI alone. So this is very um, uh, sort of tantalizing finding. In our next experiment, we might explore an adaptive AI assistant that knows something about the, the characteristics of the human and adapts itself so they can be more uh, synergistic with each other. Um, you know, uh, uh, in another uh, initiative, um, we were looking at, at at improving machine learning for doing classification and stall catcher. So when we be, when we began stall catchers, machine learning was was uh, was inadequate, as I mentioned, achieving only eighty five percent accuracy. But realizing that machine learning has improved over the last four years, and and we now have millions of human generated examples from stall catchers to help teach the machines, we decided to try again. Uh, and we partnered with Data Driven to run a stall catchers machine learning challenge, which resulted in 55 distinct AI systems that were demonstrating unprecedented accuracy. So then the next question is, what do we do with these models? You know, if, if they produce a confidence estimate about the accuracy of their of their uh, response, then we could let them tackle the easiest vessel movies and stall catchers, where they're guaranteed to be about 99% correct. And then with that kind of pre-filtering, the humans would never even have to look at about half the data, which would double our analytic throughput. So when we actually looked at some of the properties of these 55 different machine learning models that came out of the competition, we noticed something really interesting. So this is a graph showing response bias in both humans and machines, which is the tendency to say that a vessel is either flowing or stalled when all else is equal. And it turns out that the machine learning models have a response bias distribution that's very similar to our human players. And this suggests diversity in the behavior of these models. And that's diversity that could be valuable to a wisdom of crowds. So recall that wisdom of crowds relies on a, on a diversity of thinking styles. So when one person gets it wrong, several others get it right. And with many different machine-based models, we can now test what happens if we take these machine models and let them become independent stall catchers players with all the same rights and responsibilities as humans, you know, showing up on the leaderboards and getting a score and, and having their answers combined with the human answers using wisdom of crowd techniques. So another key component of this, of this kind of ecosystem we're building is the ability to connect all these pieces together. So today we're using stall catchers data to train machine learning models in a competition, and then we're manually plugging those models back into stall catchers. But with this new ecosystem, it can become a fluid and dynamic process. So the machine learning models are constantly being fed data from the humans in stall catchers. The models would be constantly improving and then taking on more of the workload as the humans are phased out, at which point they can contribute to the next you know, uh, problem we're trying to solve. Um, and and, we, and we, we have a bunch of problems lined up for sure. So you know, to learn more about this new ecosystem we're developing called Civium, um, you know, feel free to visit this, this link bit.ly slash uh, Civium intro. Um, I think today's human AI successes were, were very hard won. Um, you'll hear from some others about this. It's, it's taken tremendous time and effort. There's a lot of failure-based learning and, the, and it's very difficult to sustain these projects. So, you know, a key goal for Civium uh, and, and the ecosystem we're building is to make it easy for everyone to put computers and humans 
in the same classroom, so to speak, so we can figure out the best way they can work together as lab partners and tackle key challenges like precision medicine. So thanks a lot. Thanks, Pietro. Um, so up next is Seth from Northeastern University. Seth Cooper, will you give us, uh, can you join us and give us your presentation? Hello, thanks. Hi. Thanks for the introduction. Um, let me share my screen here. Okay, I think that is sharing now. Um, so yeah, thanks for the introduction and thanks for the good uh, introductory uh, talk there. So uh, I'm gonna talk about one of these games uh, that I've been working on, which is Foldit, um, a citizen science game. It's for protein folding and design. And so a lot of my work is looking at um, kind of like what Pietro is talking about, trying to build games for crowdsourcing or citizen science or scientific discovery, um, where the mechanics of the game are based on some kind of real world problem. And hopefully we can use the time that people put towards playing video games um, to, uh, towards solving real world problems. So, uh, and problems that are hard for computers to solve by themselves. And so one of the domains that I've been looking at for, for some time here, um, is protein folding and protein design through the game Folded, which is an online citizen science video game where the players compete and collaborate to try to find well-folded or well-designed protein structures. Um, and as, as Pietro said, it's, it's difficult for computers to sort of search the space of possibilities because it's very large and um, uh, sort of the energy landscape can be uh, quite difficult for computers to search through automatically. Uh, but the game is basically trying to combine human creativity and spatial reasoning with uh, computational power and optimization to, to find better uh, kinds of solutions to the problem. So the players can directly manipulate the protein structure by like clicking and dragging on it, uh, and they can let the computer take over and do some refinement uh, when they, you know, they think they've got a pretty good spot to, uh, to start from. Um, and so the player's goal in the game is basically to get a high score. You can see up at the top there, I think in the video, the score is changing as the player manipulates the protein structure. And so the whole game is built on top of a um, uh, piece of biochemistry software that's called Rosetta that handles the scoring and the optimizations and the protein modeling and all of that for scientific accuracy in the game. Um, so the score is basically coming out of some uh, a Rosetta evaluation of the basically the quality, the energy of the protein structure there. Uh, the game has been out for a bit over 10 years and had over half a million players at this point. And it's, it's kind of grown to a multi-institution collaboration now. Uh, I'm at Northeastern but we work really closely with uh, collaborators uh, at University of Washington, the University of Massachusetts Dartmouth, uh, University of Denver, Vanderbilt, and UC Davis, for example. Uh, and so the game, again, the game is structured as mostly as a competition because we don't actually know what sort of the best score is. Um, so a lot of the game is built around players competing against each other for a high score on particular structures. Um, so as players are playing, they can see their rank and move up the ranks and, and try to get a higher score and beat the other players. But uh, there's also a lot of collaboration in the game and uh, the players are able to form groups and work together and share what they've worked on with their groups. And so we also see that a lot of players are really interested in working together to try to help each other to solve the challenging problems that are posed. And the overall process that we use in Foldit to help scientists look something like this. Uh, we work with uh, biochemists to try to take a problem that they're interested in, say, you know, a protein that they want to find the structure of. Um, to take that and turn it into something that the game understands, which is, we call a puzzle. Uh, and so, you know, it sort of translates the problem into something that can be played in the game. And then we'll post those online and they're available usually for about a week. Uh, and during that time, the players who are uh, playing the game, you know, they try to get a high score and see who can get the highest score on uh, the structures. These, yeah, these are usually up for about a week. There's usually a couple up at a time so players can work on different things at the same time. And while they're playing, we're getting back a lot of data about uh, the structures that they find and, and how they're, they're searching the space and that kind of thing. And we can analyze the results at the end and see if they found anything interesting, see if uh, you know, maybe we could improve something about the way the puzzle was set up. Maybe we can, we can take the results from the first sort of pass through um, Folded and use those for another round and try to improve uh, sort of, and the whole game is sort of this process kind of of trying to continually improve the game to, to make better scientific results um, and make the game also kind of hopefully more interesting and fun for players. Uh, so for example, 
in addition to the scientific puzzles, Folded has this whole sequence of tutorial levels that are meant to introduce new players when they come in. Uh, so they start off fairly simple with relatively small kind of protein-like structures uh, with guides on how to beat them, how to, how, to, how to fix the problems, and how to complete the levels. Uh, they have a goal score, so when the player finishes this you know, a tutorial level, they get kind of confetti and they can move on to the next level and the levels sort of get progressively harder and introduce new, uh, more concepts. So the goal with this was kind of to make the game, make it possible for people who don't have a background in biochemistry to come in and play the game, hopefully. And we've seen that, I think, that a lot of the players who are playing and who are doing well actually have um, little to no sort of formal background in biochemistry. But they've been able to accomplish a lot of really interesting things and contribute to a number of scientific discoveries and publications. For example, one of the early kind of exciting results was the players helped to correctly predict the structure of the Mason Pfizer monkey virus retroviral protease, uh, which was a, uh, was a protein, um, a key protein in the virus that leads to AIDS in rhesus monkeys. And so some experimentalists who we collaborate with have been trying to solve it experimentally for years. Some of the latest algorithms have been applied um, unsuccessfully, but the players were actually able to solve it in uh, just about three weeks of the puzzle being up, which we thought was really exciting in that case. Um, players have also been able to develop algorithms Basically, so we, we, uh, we actually have an embedded scripting language in the game and players can code up some of their strategies. And when we analyzed some of those, we found that players were coming up with really interesting and kind of effective approaches. Uh, and in fact, they have sort of independently discovered similar techniques that some of the biochemists we were collaborating with worked on. And so that, that was kind of looking at, um, you know, players could actually codify some of their strategies to be automated. Um, we've also looked at electron density and players were able to fit structures to experimental electron density data very well. And in fact, in some cases, producing higher quality structures than uh, crystallographers or algorithms were able to produce. And we've been looking into protein design as well. For example, uh, we had players redesign an existing enzyme for the uh, Diels Alder reaction. And in fact, you know, going through this iterative process, going back and forth between the players and biochemists working on redesigning this enzyme structure. Um, they were able to come up with a, uh, an improved enzyme that was many times more effective than the, the enzyme that we started with. And so, you know, we've written papers about these. And similarly, you know, uh, we, we credit the, the players, you know, we, we try to include folded players as one of the authors on the paper um, whenever, you know, whenever we write something about something that the players found. Also recently, uh, the players were able to completely design uh, several protein structures, four protein structures from scratch. Um, that were designed de novo in the game and in fact were confirmed using x-ray crystallography that the, the structures that the players designed in the game actually you know matched the the structures that were experimentally determined and in this case there were actually four players who were actually named authors on the paper which i thought was a, also a really exciting development and i think we're seeing more of that kind of thing in um citizen science and that kind of thing is is involving the players and more of the sort of scientific process like writing papers and things like that um, there are a lot of directions of ongoing and future work now. One that I wanted to mention too is uh, uh, with collaborators at the University of Washington, uh, we're trying to run a series of puzzles where players could try to design a protein that could bind to the coronavirus spike protein and perhaps inhibit um, some of its uh, uh, properties or effectiveness. Uh, we're working with collaborators at Vanderbilt to include tools for small molecule designs like drug design and, and small molecule design in addition to protein design in the game and with some collaborators at UC Davis to look at the impact of say, putting a narrative into the game. So in those tutorial levels actually including maybe more of a story, right? That might be more interesting and engaging and see if that helps get new players into the game and continue playing than what the, the way the tutorial is set up right now. Um, something that we are interested in working on probably in the near future is virtual reality, right? And seeing if you, know, if you can have a real three-dimensional manipulation um, tools for three-dimensional structures like proteins uh, can players do better, right, than, than using a mouse and keyboard. Um, there's a couple resources related to Folded that might be of interest um, that are, you know, available online currently. Um, one is the Folded Education Mode, which is a, a mode or sort of a separate version of the game that's basically tailored for uh, classroom use or online classroom use that it builds on top of the existing tutorials in the game, which are just meant to teach, to play, meant to teach players how to play the game. But these tutorials have been redesigned a little bit to try to teach um, specific concepts about protein folding and, and protein structure. Uh, so there's a sort of 
a slightly different setup of puzzles and there's more contextual scientific information along with the gameplay hints. And so this is also available online uh, right now. And we also uh, have Folded Standalone, which is a version of the game's interface, but it's, it's not connected to the game. So it essentially would let, uh, lets people low, uh, import and export their own structures to work on using the Folded graphical interface completely separate from the game. And this is also available. So there's some links there at the bottom for anyone who's interested in those. Uh, and I wanted to um, thank everyone who's contributed to Folded Development. Uh, many, you know, many people have worked on it over the years. Um, also the people who've supported the research and the organizations who've supported the research and certainly all the players, right? Without the players, we wouldn't have had these really uh, great results and it's available. You know, you can also check out the game online there or there's my contact information as well. So that's, that's, um, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Seth. So hopefully everybody can see my screen now. Um, my name is Lee Langshan. I'm the Chief Information Officer at Cohen Veterans Bioscience. So my presentation today is going to be focused on the integration of multiple data types towards a precision medicine approach um, and think more on how we can leverage the power of both human and machine intelligence in order to create machine learning based AI models in which we can extract meaningful and more transparent results from. So firstly, I'll provide a brief introduction into Cohen Veterans Bioscience and how we approach precision medicine as an organization in order to untangle the heterogeneity that we observe within our data. Um, so I'd like to highlight the need for data integration, both within and across large cohort data. Um, and to help achieve that, we're in the process of developing a novel platform known as the Brain Commons, and I'll introduce that during my presentation. Um, I'll then finish up with an example of how we've used a combination of machine learning and human expert knowledge to derive meaningful insights from data. So Cohen Veterans Bioscience um, is a nonprofit research organization. We're dedicated to the development of diagnostic tests and personalized therapies for both veterans and civilians suffering from the effects of trauma related and other brain disorders. Um, today, few if any proven treatments exist for these conditions. So it's really our goal to fast track the availability of um, personalized therapeutics through the discovery and development of precision diagnostics and targeted therapies. Um, so just a, a brief introduction into, into where we're coming from. Um, much of medicine is still based on the treatment of symptoms. Um, we typically wait for these symptoms to progress beyond some threshold before a diagnosis is possible. Um, but there's a lot more going on at a biological level. Um, in PTSD, for example, we're typically modeling the acute stress reaction following a traumatic event. Uh, this may be governed by some pre-exposure risk factors, such as genetics. Um, a lot of the time, um, there's then a return to baseline as resiliency mechanisms take over. Um, however, in a proportion of individuals, um, there's long-term impairment. So the evidence suggests that psychiatric disorders such as PTSD and, and others are, are really diverse, heterogeneous, and biotyping the population or breaking it down into smaller, uh, more similar groups is going to be helpful um, to help us understand better the biological mechanisms driving this heterogeneity. Um, this hopefully then will lead to new insights into disease taxonomy and, and pathogenesis. Um, here's an example, um, Pietro already introduce this to a certain extent and an example workflow for precision medicine. So we're really focused on improving the traditional symptom driven practices by intelligently integrating multi omics profiles from patients together with clinical um, imaging um, and other types of data such as digital health, wearable device data, things like that in order to create multi scale computational models that represent the individual molecular profiles. Uh, this would then enable us to identify biomarkers, um, multiple markers or, or network or pathway-based signatures, and, and ultimately use these signatures in a predictive way to select the appropriate treatments and hopefully improve the success of, of those treatments, really moving away from kind of the old paradigm of, of one-size-fits-all approach to treating people. 
So big data or, or messy data, as Petro defined it, um, really is essential for the discovery of these biomarkers to help us untangle disease biology, help us stratify patients in this way. Um, Cloud-based technologies really have the potential to unleash the combined power of, of AI and machine learning to build predictive models, to analyze now petabyte size, multimodal data sets. Um, so to assist this and to assist the brain health community in sharing and analyzing both, both legacy and also newly generated data, um, Cone Veterans Bioscience have built the, the Brain Commons. This is a, a digital ecosystem, uh, which we feel is uniquely able to meet some of the, the common data analysis challenges currently facing researchers. Um, so the image here um, hopefully shows how we need to really leverage a, a cross industry approach uh, where researchers can collaboratively combine and harmonize data sets. Um, so, for example, we have clinicians exploring large cohort data. Um, they may not have the machine learning or statistical expertise, um, but they are able to provide the clinical insights. They are able to help us ask the, the questions they know are clinically relevant, such as what is the underlying biology driving disease progression? For example. Um, so within this platform, um, they're able to use tools within this environment to, uh, to identify phenotypes that they see in the clinic. Um, we know that um, whole genome sequencing data is now readily available in large quantities. Um, for example, with PTSD until recently, it was thought to be only a social construct, uh, but now we know that genetics does play a role. Um, so here the uh, geneticist is, is able to look at these phenotypes identified by the clinician as important and then generate a polygenic risk score, for example, that, that may then offer clues into who might be at increased risk of developing a disorder. Um, citizen scientists um, also play an important role here, um, helping us gather and contribute data for research, um, even in real time, as I said, with wearable devices. Um, so we have various personas to narrow the search space and narrow the questions that we're asking so that finally the, the bioinformatician or the data scientist can start to bring those pieces of information together. So the clinical questions, the genetics, other types of data and so on to run those uh, bioinformatics pipelines, those advanced computational approaches really to build these multidimensional disease models relevant to that um, population or the question of interest. So, so I'll give you a, a very quick um, real example of something we've been working on previously. Um, here we aim to take a systems biology approach um, that is integrating, again, these high dimensional data sets. The example here was some gene expression data, and we also had an abundance of clinical and, and phenotypic data. Uh, and we really wanted to identify disease subtypes um, and potentially biomarkers of disease relapse in multiple sclerosis. Um, and we hope that this type of approach would help further our understanding of this disorder. Um, importantly, trying to figure out what's driving disease progression, what are the uh, biological underpinnings um, which are relevant here. Um, so typically, um, for those of you who are familiar with these types of data sets, uh, the results of, of studies um, are tens, hundreds of, of genes. Um, sometimes these solutions are difficult to interpret. Uh, and unfortunately, here, uh, from a purely data-driven approach, um, we had a solution which was overfit. Um, that is, um, the, the models performed well on the training set, but when we applied the model to an independent test sample, the results didn't replicate. Um, so we saw no difference between the predicted groups, as you see on the plot there. Um, so what we did um, is, rather than focus on individual genes and a, and a purely data-driven approach, we, we we uh, made the decision to really think about engineering features that um, integrated the gene expression data with some prior knowledge. Uh, that prior knowledge was around how genes and proteins are known to work together to perform some biological function. Um, so what this does is it introduces a biological constraint into the model. Um, so capturing associations between genes while keeping the search space uh, more manageable. Um, so in this example, we used a cohort of around 200 subjects and, and we were able to then start to think about those pathways um, and networks which, um, whose expression um, activity profiles showed um, some association with time to relapse in this population. So the heat map on the left summarizes the solution with the activity of each pathway uh, represented by this blue to red color scale here. Um, we observed three main clusters, um, or risk groups as we call them, based on these expression patterns. So they're colored um, red, green, and blue. So we then evaluated the biomarker signature, um, and you see the results on the right with the Kaplan and Meyer plot. Um, and what we saw is that um, those various groups had significant differences between them with respect to time to relapse, ranging from a subset of patients with very good 
um, prognosis um, through to uh, a subset with very poor prognosis in red who relapsed very quickly. So I, I mentioned that it's often very difficult to interpret kind of large numbers of important features from these data sets. Um, however, when we start to incorporate the prior knowledge curated by the human experts into the solution, as we did here, we can then immediately start to generate insights from the models. Um, so on the right here, we observed um, high connectivity um, across the selected genes. So that highlights their biological interplay and potential relevance. Um, and when interrogating these models with domain experts um, and curated content from the literature, um, on the left here, we saw that the genes were mainly enriched on pathways related to immune and neurological processes. Um, the, the pathway you see on the left um, was previously curated to be specific to multiple sclerosis and many genes making, making up this biomarker were already known biomarkers or, or drug targets of multiple sclerosis and other brain disorders such as schizophrenia, dementia and depression. So this is something we couldn't see or couldn't identify using the purely data-driven approach. So just to finish up, um, I introduced a collaboration model in which we hope will shift diagnosis, treatment and prevention um, of these disorders from the old symptom-based approach to a more biologically, mechanistically based one, really guiding personalized interventions. Uh, I presented briefly the Brain Commons platform. Uh, this is a cloud-based uh, collaboration platform for data and analytics, which we hope will aid researchers in overcoming some of their common data sharing silos and challenges. Um, and then finally, I showed an example of where the purely data-driven model didn't really reach a good solution, um, but where a more of a collaborative approach introducing prior knowledge around disease biology was really important. Um, and we've shown that that, and others have shown that that really often yields superior performance in machine learning classification and regression tasks. Um, and also at the same time has the added benefit where it assist us in interpreting potential drivers of disease state. So highlighting the importance of humans as domain experts in interpreted, interpreting these solutions in order to inform our understanding of biology. Thank you. No, thank you for uh... Uh, all this talk before, for me that was quite interesting and I think I introduced well uh, what I would try to present now. So my name is Jean Valdispul. I'm an associate professor of computer science at McGill University and I speak today about work I've done the uh, last 10 years through Philo to Borderlands Science. Uh, that is uh, trying to provide a framework to to expand the initiatives the, and, the, and the challenges uh, that we've seen so far uh, at population scale. So 5,000 lifetime, that's roughly what we're playing collectively playing, we're playing video games every, every week. That's a huge amount of time that people are playing video games. And you think about it, video games uh, is actually solving a problem. So the, the mission of my lab is we really try to, to understand how we can bring genomics to the gamer. Uh, we initially built games to, uh, to understand how a problem can be framed into a game. But the next challenge, if you want to reach the population and the real gamers, is to see how we can bring this game right into the universe and how we can basically uh, engage millions of people uh, helping us to solve some task. So my goal uh, as a bioinformatician, so I'm a computer scientist. So initially, I'm, uh, from the beginning, I'm developing algorithm and the machine learning model try to better uh, analyze genomes and uh, other biomolecules. And our goal is to build this infrastructure, this complete infrastructure and this algorithm to analyze uh, the, the raw data we're receiving from, from sequencers. The problem we try to, uh, to address uh, through the, the, the Philo and the Borderlands I'm presenting today is uh, a core problem in, in, in biology. So the multiple sequence alignment, pro alignment problem. To give you an idea, I mean, the first algorithm that we're addressing this problem is among the 10 most cited paper in the world. Uh, what's the purpose of this? Well, we take completely different genomes and our goal is try to reveal patterns that conserve across species because it helps us to understand how our genomes are structured. And in practice, what we receive is a, a plenty of data, genomes from many different species. And it's kind of messy data that doesn't look very fun at first. Uh, it turns out that the problem for aligning this data together 
is uh, among the most difficult problem that we know in computer science. It's an NPR problem here. And moreover, another problem that is very uh, recurrent in all the problems we try to address uh, in citizen science is really um, that we don't have a good objective method for solving this. So the, 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 the truth of that is like typically what's happening is that we develop algorithms over years that are working relatively well, but the result is never perfect. And scientists are uh, checking this result and eventually correcting manually uh, the result through interfaces like the one I presented here. And this is interesting from a point of view because uh, you see right away that the main difference with the, the previous slide I showed to you is that uh, here the different uh, nucleotide of the sequence uh, we're using color to represent them. And the task of making an alignment more uh, likely and more uh, uh, better is consists actually trying to align in and bring a bit of coherency to this uh, the, the picture represented by this. And that allows us to tap into the visual pattern recognition of human brain that is very developed and very efficient. But the problem is like with the amount of data we're receiving, uh, it's almost impossible to, to ask human to, 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 check the, to check all alignment. Moreover, uh, we still need to improve the method and we want to, to learn better algorithm and we want to collect the data to collect as much uh, data as possible to, to, uh, to learn better methods for doing this. And so the idea we have here is like trying to, to leverage the observation we made with the, 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 the sequence alignment uh, interfaces we realized that actually it wasn't a, a very a boring task from the point of view of the, of the user to do. And it was actually kind of funny. So we tried basically to, to push it even more, to get something that is very fun to play, to the point where uh, when you play it, you can almost completely forget the, the scientific uh, context in which you're playing the game. That's why we did in Philo that was launched in 2010 and has been running from them. So, and where you see that the interface, one of the interface we we, we propose uh, make complete abstraction of the ACGT that we see in the sequence. And typically the goal here is to try to, uh, to manipulate this, uh, the different uh, bricks, different tiles, a bit like you will do in a Tetris and, and try to, uh, to create columns of the same color and minimizing the mismatch in the colors and, and the gaps because they bring you penalties. So it's really trying to find a trade-off in, into this. And um, so the game is very, is very simple. You can play it even ignoring the, um, the, the science part. And uh, once you finish it, you don't have these bitter days that basically you, you just play uh, regular time matching games. Uh, but indeed your results are stored and used internally try to improve alignment. So of course, we won't ask to a single uh, player to, to uh, to align the whole sequences that would defeat the purpose here. But the, the, what we, we tried to build, uh, I was explaining in all the previous talk before, is really try to uh, first have a first pass, uh, make pre-alignment with computer algorithm, uh, try to identify the regions that are not uh, well aligned. We put that in database, these are the puzzles you're playing, and we reinsert everything into the initial alignment. So of course, this type of reinsertion is, um, is a bit more tricky than it seems here because what you want to do ultimately are multiple things. First, you want to use the data to improve the alignment, but you also want to use the data we're collecting to, be, to learn better method for aligning the, the, the sequences. So just to make a, a long story short, uh, Philo was a, um, has been running for the last decade and over years we have something, uh, we estimate something about uh, 350,000 participants at least. Uh, one uh, key thing of Philo was that usually uh, the idea was to, to have the minimum in engagement from the player. So you can go to the website, you don't need to register, you play the game and you play. And that resulted in having a larger user base, but potentially with the risk having uh, less, uh, we can track less the players or we have uh, less engagement in a long period of time. But it was a different approach we want to try. And overall, we collect one million solution and that enabled us to show that we were able to improve uh, algorithms, so different type of algorithm which we tried to compare with, but about between 40 and 95% of the solution previously returned by computers. And I was a touch also just before with, um, 
with, uh, with, with Sev. Of course, one of the major outcomes from my point of view as well was that uh, all the, the, the accent he has on uh, science outreach and education. So the, the, the latest version also introduced a story, try to bring more the, the people inside it and inside the game and that helped to, to promote the engagement. But the real goal of all this is that what we, we want to do is create basically engage, I was saying from the beginning, millions of players to help us to address the, the biggest challenge in science. And if you want to address this, you need to go where the players are. You need to go uh, and bring genomics to the gamers, not the opposite. So the question is like, how can you bring citizen science to the game like this? Uh, in the first person shooter, fast action playing games, that doesn't seem like a good fit for this. And that's actually what we did with Gearbox. We recently launched the Borderland Science uh, project that is um, a, a version, an evolved version of Philo that is available to the player uh, into the, the Borderlands game. So just to give you an idea, Borderlands game has been sold, the previous version, to tens of millions of copies is one of the top, and it was a top selling game last year. So um, it's one of the major game, and the, the idea of the project was how to bring Philo into the universe. And we work with the, the game designer there, try to re revisit fully the team. This is basically the interface that you're having when you're playing Borderlands Science. Uh, we completely redesigned the game by uh, having instead of playing horizontally, play vertically, we simplify the, the, the scoring system. And that help us basically to accelerate the pace and have a very fast puzzles. But also we are able to leverage the reward system inside the game. So, and, and here it's kind of very important because if you want to promote engagement, you can use the, the, the currency system implement to the game. So you can play the game and use the time you spend there to, uh, to uh, upgrade your character into the game. And it's a very powerful tool to engage some players that will uh, extensively play for this. So uh, that's um, an important benefit that you have about integrating this into the game. But a, a last piece of the puzzle is like, if you, you, you take a such major initiatives, you also have to team up with a uh, major uh, and, and large project. So here we bring the, the initially Philo was focusing on a uh, human, uh, human sequence alignment, but mammal sequence alignment. But what we did here is like we have a partnership with, with uh, the team of Rob Knight at UCSD, where our goal is really to, to improve the microbiome data um, sequences and alignment that I use uh, at UCSD. And that provides us uh, a long term goal and the potential repurposing the framework for many applications with a large impact on science. And just to give you uh, the statistics before finishing, uh, so we launched uh, Borderland Science in April 2020. So uh, that's a couple of months ago. And what was very uh, striking for us uh, compared to previous number is like in, in three months, we managed to get a 1 million participant that generate 50 million solution for us. So that's an engagement that is uh, better in terms of number of participants and also in order of making much better than was obtained before uh, with Fido because the participants are much more engaged and play much more. Uh, the game itself. So of course, all the results here are, uh, uh, are being studied and we're trying to uh, hopefully have results relatively soon. Um, and uh, I just want to thank all the, the collaborators on this and McGill, but also MM MMOS, which is a company that brings this idea of uh, using AAA games uh, as a platform for citizen science games, uh, Gearbox software that, that contributed for, for making all these possible and uh, UCSD that is uh, providing us data analyzing with you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, hopefully I'll stay with you for the duration of the rest of our conversation. Um, so we've got, again, you can ask questions in either the Zoom chat or the Pathable chat. We will be um, consolidating those. And I've got a whole long list now, so we might kind of bounce around as we get as we go through these. But we've got one in the chat box right now. What results did you find for multiple sequence alignments after insertion and evolution? For anybody? Everybody's coming back. Uh, sorry, yeah, I didn't hear your last question. Can you repeat the question, please? What results did you find for multiple? Sequence alignment after insertion and evolution, and did you all 
deleting some parts of the sequence. So what would, we, we demonstrated actually uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Fido actually initially was um, that we, we compare different uh, aligners and different objective function, try to see what the diversity of function that were there. And, and every time we, we show that based on the, the solution provided initially by the, by the, by the, the computer program, the uh, solution returned by the by the the, the player uh, were enabling us to to improve this alignment by different order of magnitude. There was never a major uh, re uh, rearrangement because some score were quite optimized, but uh, it basically showed that based on the scoring function, all the algorithm that was implemented were not doing the best job possible on the the platform that the, on the. The, da the data they were using. So there was still room for improvement on the heuristic used by the programs. Um, so I, I hope that answers the questions. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so did somebody else want to jump in? No? All right. So I had a question about, um, Seth mentioned this, and Lee sort of touched on it, but when, how are you giving credit to these gamers? Um, in Jerome's example, he's got a million players. I mean, how do they deserve credit? If so, what might that look like? Um, how do we reward them in a more sort of to the game way? I guess I can mention some things basically. In, in Folded, I mean, a lot of the, the reward is sort of in in game right um and so there's a leaderboards people get their you know um they get their name on the leaderboards on the website and that kind of thing and um but but yeah we do think it's important to sort of credit players for their discovery so um you know if there's anything that sort of goes into a, a paper right um that you know we can attribute to particular players then we'll usually you know contact the players and ask them if they want to you know be on the paper, help write the paper. And interestingly enough, until recently, um, most most of the players have declined to, to be, um, to, you know, be like authors on a scientific paper. Uh, it seems like perhaps the, you know, the in-game rewards is actually maybe more interesting to gamers. Um, mm -hmm. But, um, you know, recently in like the, the most recent design paper, several of the players actually wanted to be authors and, and so on. And in fact, recently, um, you know, when we include folded players as an author now, uh, we can include them as like a consortium, essentially author. And so okay. as part of sort of like the supplementary information in the paper, we can include like the members of the folded players consortium. And, you know, it's, but it's all, it's all like opt in, right? If they're, if they're interested in being right. included. Um, How much do you know about any of your players? How many of them are gamers for gamers sake? And how many of them are, scientists who are also playing games and how many of them are brilliant 10 year olds rocking it yeah i can i can take a stab at that one um you know i think it's it's probably a little different for each project in stall catchers um we think we have a, a bimodal distribution we have uh young players students you know probably ages you know 10 to 15 and then we have retired folks you know and caregivers of uh for alzheimer's disease <clears throat> uh but it's it's fun because it's kind of like the grandparents and the grandchildren in the same game and we have an in-game chat and you see these cross-generational relationships form and and we've had heated competitions too where we've had retirement communities on one team and then students in a middle school on another team and it's like, it's, it's cutthroat until the very end, but still, you know, there's this great competition, but also everyone is sort of in there cooperating uh, to, to accelerate Alzheimer's research and a very healthy uh, kind of community culture. Anybody else? I think I can probably comment, but it's outside of the gaming field, but more maybe in the research space. Um, so for example, with, with the Brain Commons platform, I briefly mentioned where, thinking about how we can better engage the community of scientists and, and citizen scientists. So uh, for example, we want to encourage researchers to um, submit tools and, and pipelines, analysis pipelines that they're developing. Um, and, and it's always um, kind of the trade-off between asking them to submit something and how we incentivize them to do that. Um, so we can kind of 
attribute them to a specific tool. And then as that gets used, hopefully by the research community in deriving insights from data, then, then they can be credited with that tool and um, be, be recognized as the developer of that tool, which hopefully gives them more exposure for, for the, their creativity. So that's just something which is maybe not specific to gaming, but really about how we engage in community and, and incentivizing researchers. Yeah, thanks. Um, so let's talk about engaging community. Um, we, when you were engaging people um, in Pietro's early slides, he was talking about um, once you get past 20, you started having useful numbers. How many, what are the required sample sizes for analyzing large high dimensional data sets um, so that we get useful information out of it? For anybody. I, I mean, I think with respect to sample sizes and how big the data needs to be to generate insights, then um, I think that depends on um, what we're trying to achieve. Um, so what is the, the question? Uh, if it's a classification problem, for example, and we want to stratify two populations, um, then um, the sample size required to be able to do that in a reproducible way very much depends on kind of what we call the classification difficulty. Um, so as, a, as an example, um, several years ago, um, the FDA um, set up a, a consortium to develop good machine learning practices. Um, and um, one of the projects there was thinking about um, sample size um, in these high dimensional data sets. Um, so if you're doing something very easy, very simple, like um, discriminating gender, which is pretty easy to do with, with gene expression. Um, you need um, relatively small sample sizes, maybe 20 males and females. Um, but, but if you're doing something very difficult, um, like um, maybe trying to predict progression re survival in uh, a, a complex cancer endpoint, then the sample size is quickly increased to maybe 200 or more. So um, yeah, I think it's all down to the, the what we call the classification difficulty um, and we can do estimates um, depending on that as to how many samples we would need so we can power our studies appropriately. I think one thing I, I might add is uh, um, that um, you know data quality <clears throat> is not really uh, uh, um, it, there's no sort of absolute concept of data quality it's always with it's always with respect to an application and and so we encountered this with with stall catchers in that um, um, because uh, in, in stall catchers, the goal is to is to find these these capillaries that have stalled, and they represent about one percent of of the, the capillaries in a in a in a typical data set. Um, it so that makes uh, if you consider those true positives, the researchers are really keen on not missing any of those true positives, but they're willing to tolerate um, a, a certain number of of um, of false positives. So um, once you kind of know, um, you know, what the research goals are and what the, the data quality go goals are, then you have tuning knobs and you can say, okay, well, you know, we're never going to get 100% accuracy, but we know what's really important to these researchers is this, you tune it to that. Um, and then it's, it's more achievable. Um, and then you, you know, so there's always this, this sort of optimization, at least in the crowdsourcing platforms that we build, you're, you're both trying to achieve data quality, but you're trying to do it with the minimum amount of time uh, from any human volunteer. So there's kind of an ethical aspect to this. You know, we, we don't want to tax people's time any more than is absolutely necessary. So that's part of what motivates us is, is we want to speed up the research, get the analysis done as fast as possible and not waste anyone's time. So it's really this balancing all these things. Um, I have a question for Pietro. You said early on that um, that by letting the AI handle the low-hanging fruit, it was the grabber with the apple, uh, then you've improved your throughput because the humans don't have to waste their time on that. Do the humans not benefit from learning too? Don't they get better with volume? Or no? Yeah, no, I, th I think that's... that's I think that's. A <laughs> What's that? Seth was nodding. He, oh yeah, he I think yeah. So so, so Neth, <laughs> Seth will probably have more to say on this. Um, but I, I mean, I think from from my standpoint, the quick answer is we're not short on data. Um, so what we do by giving the machines the low hanging fruit is we we isolate the data that humans are looking at to the most challenging uh, examples. Um, 
at the same time, you know, you could imagine that you have new people coming to the game who don't want to see the most challenging examples right away. And for this purpose, we have what we call our calibration uh, samples, where we already know the answers to these, and we, we throw them out there to help teach people how to play the game. As they get better at the game, we start throwing more, the more challenging ones at them. So, Seth, did you have something to add? Yeah, and I would I would agree with all of that. I mean, yeah, like pro it's probably not a good idea to just start players off in the most challenging examples that you can find that you know that even the computers couldn't solve, right? Um, like I was talking about in Foldit, there's this tutorial sequence of kind of onboarding levels, right, where it starts off very simple and you know gets gradually harder, and um, you know we use that in Foldit and in other games that we've developed too. Um, something that and, and actually in Folded, we've, we've put a decent amount of work, I would say, into designing that kind of onboarding experience. Like what happens when someone starts playing, you know, what are they going to see? How, you know, how frustrated are they going to get right away? Uh, how quickly can you advance them through things, right? Um, I'm, you know, full, I, I don't think we're, you know, anywhere near like the perfect <laughs> sequence of tutorial levels in Folded for sure. Um, but uh, so we try to design kind of like an on an on ramp and onboarding that that helps new players um, come into the game. And right now, in Folded, it's it's like static, right? Everyone you know everyone goes through the same sequence. But um, in some other games, we've been working on systems to do this dynamically. And basically, um, you know, depending on how well someone does on a particular level, uh, they you know if they do well, they'll get something harder. If they do poorly, they might get something easier to the point where you know, eventually they'll get to sort of like the interesting scientific challenges and that kind of thing. Um, so it's something also that we're hoping to be able to integrate into to fold it as well, but this kind of dynamic difficulty adjustment. And for that, you, you know, you could use like real instances of real problems that had previously been solved because then you have a better idea of actually maybe how hard they are. That's that's exactly what we do in stall catchers today. Except that we were, you know, we we were motivated to do it from the get go because we knew that we might have Alzheimer's patients uh, playing the game, and um, you know, in Alzheimer's disease, there's this phenomenon known as sundowning. Uh, that's kind of related to the, the circadian rhythm we all experience. We all have our afternoon slumps, but in, in Alzheimer's, you know, that's a that's a a more dramatic sort of cognitive slump in the afternoon. So um, our difficulty can actually ramp down as well as up, you know, d dynamically, as you were suggesting, Seth, uh, you know, based on how people are doing sort of moment to moment. Um, and this makes it possible for people, you know, to uh, you know, to, to, to um, you know, play confidently and be getting enough of these right to get enough easy ones when they need easy ones and, and so on. So it's, it's been helpful. Do you want to, um, you want your players to keep playing too. If they feel discouraged and overwhelmed, then you've lost somebody who could have been contributing to the study or to the... Yeah, if you can add to this, um, you have to also acknowledge that not all players have motivation indeed. Uh, you can discourage them, it's too complicated, but you can also discourage them if it's too simple. Uh, and that's also what we had developed. With, with Philo, we developed some interface where they have a, some expert mode when you can go get, go get crazy puzzles. Uh, and um, what is always hard with this uh, uh, is understanding the diversity of the population and making a, and not trying a solution to force to everyone. You have to try to, to basically offer a, a lot of solutions to different players so that you can adapt the crowd and being more efficient. Um, so let's, early on we had mentioned human in the loop and what we're talking about right now, the, the gamers can be anybody. Anybody can play and the sort of whole idea is that the crowd itself has a wisdom that any individual does not have. Um, but when Lee has built Brain Commons, you were talking about the importance of bringing the expertise in. So can we talk about the how human in the loop models perform compared to models without human involvement. Um, I know that Pietro's argument is that they are better. Are they always better? And do you need the right kinds of humans in the loop? Anybody? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's a great question, and, and I'd like to hear hear what Lee has to say on this as well. Um, so I'll just give a brief a brief response. Is that um, I, I think one of one of the directions that that science uh, could go as we as we bring uh, more public participation into the scientific process is that 
um, you have tasks um, that require general human cognitive abilities um, that were previously performed by scientists, even though anyone could do those tasks, or if you stripped away the domain knowledge requirements of those tasks, anyone can do those. So what, we're, what I think we're really doing is we're saying, you know, we still have domain expertise. We still have people who have studied diseases, you know, like some of the folks that were constraining the input to Lee's model um, who need to bring that domain knowledge in. And that's very, that's very useful. You can't just, you know, uh, teach someone how to have that knowledge in the course of, uh, of, of uh, you know, uh, uh, on ramping to a game. Um, so, so, so we end up with domain experts um, spending more of their time on stuff where they actually have expertise to bring to the problem. And I, I think that ends up being a more effective division of labor than what, what we traditionally have. But uh, yeah, Lee, what do, you, what do you think? We, yeah, it's an interesting question. We haven't compared um, the, the so-called experts versus the, the kind of the citizen scientists uh, with respect to some of the, the content that the, the underlying biological kind of prior knowledge that I, that I spoke about. Uh, we know that introducing the prior knowledge definitely helps um, versus a, kind of a purely data-driven approach as I touched on, and, that, and that's been shown a lot in, 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 in um, other types of work as well. Um, that the interpretation is important because often we see that um, the, the pure, the model based approach. Um, so, so an AI model might, might be quite complex where the um, underlying kind of solution might, an underlying linear solution might be more preferable to us um, because it's more interpretable. Um, so I think they're having the human interpret kind of that output and um, guide towards a, a preference is is really helpful. Um, I think on the on the kind of the more kind of citizen science side of things, although I haven't done this, um, some of, some of what we're working on is um, helping with kind of labeling of data. So um, kind of the the data labeling process prior to developing a, a machine learning model. Um, labeling data is actually quite a privileged position to be in we find especially when we're learning from wearable device data for example um, we often don't have labels and it's not easy to get them um, so um, those sanity checks are really helpful as we build our models and, and we can rely on these so-called soft labeling efforts um, where we can ask maybe a patient or a caregiver or, or any scientist really to provide some kind of con context around what they're doing at any given particular time like i was out walking at noon or I, I was sleeping between these hours. Um, so it's not a label per se, but it does provide us with context for these sanity checks as we're building the models. Um, so um, hopefully that helps. Um, we haven't really done the, the comparison, but I, but I think that would be an interesting experiment. So in all of these situations and all of your different kind of models, have the citizen scientist or the gamers found anything that really surprised you? Um, not the finding that wasn't a finding, not the a Tylenol metabolite, but something that turned out to be real that was surprising. Well, I can say, I mean, I think the design designs, the protein designs that players come up with, I mean, just the fact that in a game they designed a protein or redesigned a protein and then, uh, you know, it was synthesized in a lab and it came out to be the same structure that they designed in the game. Um, mm -hmm. Because in those, you know, in those cases, we're not necessarily looking for like a specific structure or anything. So, you know, the things that they, if they come up with something and it kind of works, um, right? It's, I mean, uh, it's 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 interesting. It's it's uh, the things they come up with are kind of surprising. They come up, and I mean, sometimes they'll, you know, we've we've sometimes we've had, um, I don't know, like, pro, just like, uh, players will come up with kind of like aesthetically interesting proteins that aren't realistic, you know, but they're just like they're like interesting shapes and things like that that they're able to fit the the proteins into not that you know would probably have no chance of like folding up in in reality but uh they're kind of interesting and um one of the things that we actually found is that players are um actually quite good at finding kind of like loopholes right in the computational systems in a way right so you know in rosetta there you know there's this there's a um, you know, it's an optimization problem. So there's this sort of like objective energy function. And then there's the algorithm that tries to make move to the protein to, to optimize the energy. Uh, and players will try things that the algorithms just never try to find. And so they'll find like these little holes that they can kind of poke in the energy function. Um, one of which was, so like regular helices in, in a protein are, you know, they repeat, they sort of repeat every four 
residues, right? But some of the players found that you, if you slightly unwind them, if you slightly unwind the, the helices and you make, I think what's called like a pi helix, so it repeats every five residues, uh, the Rosette energy function would actually score that way higher. And so, you know, um, the players all started making these. They knew that they weren't, you know, really good, but they were getting more points for that. And so eventually, you know, uh, they, um, our collaborators went back and sort of fixed up this kind of little hole in the energy function that the players have found, which the algorithm that searches space would never, never do, right? But the players are just trying all sorts of different things. Um, and that's part of that iterative process, right? Yeah, um, and that's also the balance between are your players playing for discovery or are they playing for points? Yeah. What do you I, want and what works? Yeah, and I think the players wanted us to fix that because they want they want those two things to align, right? The 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 game rewards and the scientific purpose. In fact, I, just, I didn't talk. Oh, sorry, Frank. On top of that, like actually, we are, the the purpose of this game is actually to find things that will surprise us, right? And things that computer couldn't do naturally. So that's why we we need you to to add human creativity. I think that's what was in one of the slides of. Uh, of uh, Pietro at the beginning, like so we need to enhance the performance of the algorithm. And, but beyond just the, what is it, I think even more interesting from us could be, it's not just a solution, it's the process, try to learn the process that, that learn uh, the human to do something differently than we do by computer. We want to learn new way of doing things and by querying the crowd through games, which I think is the, the, the way we try to approach things uh, this way. Maybe Pietro, you wanted to, to add to this, thanks. Hmm. I, I, I think I had something, but I think, it, yeah, I think it's escaped me for the, for the time. Oh, there was just one thing is kind of a funny thing. Um, uh, so, so um, one of Seth's colleagues uh, in Foldit, uh, who is one of the originators of the, of the project, I think, uh, Firas uh, Khatib, uh, is teaching a, a, a course on citizen science. And uh, he, he wanted to let his students loose on our stall catchers game. And he, he, he kind of wrote me ahead of time and warned me, he said, you know, I, these are computer science students and some of them are really good hackers. So I just want to warn you. Uh, and I, 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 said, I, I said, could you please ask them to try to hack the game? And, you know, if they can successfully hack it and provide a workaround so that we can seal that gap, then we'll include them as a co-author on a paper about, about doing that. And, uh, and he put that out there and even uh, he even offered to give them extra credit if they could hack it. And it worked out. So someone actually found a loophole to make your score go up without really adding to the research. And, and then they, they gave us a solution to it. So it was, it was fantastic. You know, we get help from everywhere. Did yeah, we lose our host? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, we, uh, it's an, it was last year, I'm not sure if she'll go back, but um, so maybe just to follow up on this, did, I think one of the, the paper that inspired me uh, a lot actually uh, indeed from uh, what I was uh, just mentioning was this, uh, uh, when in, in, in Folded basically, you basically design new algorithm that were, uh, uh, I think it was a PNS paper, right, in 2011 or something like this, when you design algorithm based on the observation you made from the from the, the player and there was also similar to things we were working on similarly. I'm, I'm not remind exactly just the, the, the full story, but it looks, uh, uh, it was very inspiring paper from my point of view. Thank you. Yeah, I think that that was probably the one that I mentioned where, you know, we have a, there's a Lua interpreter embedded in the game and so players can actually write some code. And so we are just looking at, I think they can write, they can write little algorithms in Lua and actually share them with each other on the website. And so we are looking at sort of some of the most popular ones. And it, it turned out that the, I think by far the more popular one was something that it um, sort of made the, uh, the repulsive energy term in the score function kind of go up and down. So the protein could kind of like, could kind of compress itself more easily. Um, and it was similar to, to an approach that um, some of our collaborators were developing at the time too. Well, thank, thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, another, uh... Uh, in terms of participation in different parts of the scientific process where we, we had an unexpected contribution. Uh, one of our players um, who had been tracking, so we always, we always get feedback about, you know, this is the data set that you're working on right now. This is the research question we're asking. We have to do it carefully. We don't want to bias uh, the results, but 
what the, the specific task is so abstracted from the research question that that's often not an issue for us. But, um, but we had someone who'd been following the different research questions and finally said, hey, have you ever looked at the impact of exercising on these capillary stall rates in Alzheimer's mice? And we kind of looked at each other, uh, well, not me, but the Cornell folks doing the Alzheimer's research looked at each other and said, uh, yeah, no, we haven't looked at that. And yes, we, we can. I mean, you know, mouse wheel is pretty common piece of lab equipment. Um, so, they, so they actually did that study. And one of the, the publications I showed in my, my talk earlier was that exact study where the hypothesis had been generated by one of our participants. Um, so I thought that was kind of a, uh, a cool way to, to, to contribute uh, that was atypical. Um, so it looks like we, I'm, I'm going to, uh, in, until we get our moderator back, I'm going to put on the moderation hat a bit too. Um, I, I'm not sure, I guess we have, uh, we have a little more time. Um, we have about five more minutes. So I want to reel this back in a little to precision medicine. Um, and, um, and Seth, I think you mentioned uh, before the panel um, and corresponded something about, um, so, so we talk about how, how every person is an N of one, right? So that makes it really hard, you know, each person is a case study and, that, and that's intractable to a lot of the statistics we use. On the other hand, you can get, um, you can collect a lot of the same kind of data from one person over time. And I, and I think Seth, you were talking about adaptive systems that measure and can can tune sort of general results to an individual, maybe with Fitbit or something. Could you speak to that? Yeah, sure. This is something that it's, it's kind of ongoing and a little bit in in process, but um, and uh, I you know didn't have enough time to put it in the slides that I had. <laughs> but um, you know, working with uh, other collaborators at Northeastern, we're trying to develop a game for uh, basically like activity recognition based on accelerometer data. So if you just have like like a Fitbit or raw accelerometer data. Uh, could you figure out, you know, what kinds of activities the person was doing um, at a at a very high level of granularity? And so, of course, um, the collaborators that we're working with, um, they have developed, uh, you know, machine learning algorithms, right? They can train and, and other kinds of algorithms to to do that kind of labeling automatically. But they're interested in improving them and seeing again, seeing how it compares to, um, you know, crowd based labeling. Uh, and so, one thing, you know. That we've been talking about doing is you could run this sort of if you have this sort of general purpose um, model that's been trained you could lab you could use it to label an individual's data and then you could ask them to maybe fix up a little bit of that so you know mm. show them have have them uh, correct essentially the algorithm where you know it says they were doing one thing but they know they were doing something else and maybe um, then you could sort of retrain and on just that one person and use that to then go back and relabel all the rest of their data and hopefully improve, right? So in that case, you could have these sort of general purpose models that then can be retrained for each individual. Uh, and so that's something that, you know, we're hoping to, to, to work on in the near future and see how it works out. That sounds really exciting. It reminds me of, of sort of the speaker independent speech recognition systems, you know, where, where you talk to Siri and then it types out what, what you're saying and, uh, and, and then how, how those were eventually designed to start out with a basic capability and then start to learn the speech patterns of the specific user. And I think you're talking about something very analogous to that in the activity yeah. space. Is that right? Yeah. yeah, very similar to that. So, you know, having something sort of general purpose, but then try to tailor it to each individual Right, right. Um, no, that's really cool. So another another uh, topic that that might be of interest as uh, we have a few minutes left, um, it, it more uh, again in the precision medicine uh, arena, is um, you know I, I heard a fascinating talk uh, by Rich Caruana, who's a, a senior principal, exalted you know researcher. I, I lose track of all these titles. He's just like a really smart guy at Microsoft. Um, and um, he, um, uh, formerly at Cornell, and, and he was talking about transparency in AI systems. So, you know, uh, you get some kind of a, a, a fancy model that spits out some, some patterns and results. And, um, and so you start to say, oh, there's an association like between some input factors and patient outcomes, because you're trying to figure out how to do triage. And, um, but if it's a neural network model, you know, the, 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 the representation that leads to that connection is kind of opaque. It's very hard for us to disentangle all those connection weights and say, well, what is this, like, 
how do we explain why these factors are related to these outcomes? There's no real explanatory value, at least it's, it's, it's very hidden. Um, but then uh, Rich talks about the, this new version of generalized additive models where they do these pairwise comparisons of different factors, but it's much more sophisticated than the original uh, it's kind of like a very fancy form of logistic regression, except um, instead of just having weights on each variable, you have entire functions of each variable that are being combined. And the output of this system not only performs, at least in, in, the, in the areas he reported, as well or better than neural networks, but it's more interpretable. And, um, and then what you get you know, coming out of this is for, for each factor or set of factors is you get kind of a, a graph that shows the impact of that factor with respect to some outcome measurement. So what's interesting about this kind of output is not only is it interpretable, but it can give you a window into bias in the system. So you can sort of tease apart clinical factors versus say societal sociological factors. So if you look at it and you say, oh, age is a factor, but then we have this discontinuity in the graph at age 65. Oh, well, people retire at age 65, they have new insurance, they have different quality of care. Suddenly you realize it's not a clinical factor, really, it's a circumstantial kind of factor. And then you decide whether that's important or not. So, you know, it occurred to me that you could do analysis on this output, either using new machine models or crowds that could be taught to look for these kinds of characteristic signals um, to help with the interpretability. But I'm wondering, Lee, do you use such techniques in your own systems, these kind of generalized additive models or the GA2Ms as, as they're called, the fancier versions of these? And, and, and have you encountered these interpretability issues? That's a great question. So, so we haven't been using those specific techniques. Um, something we have been looking at is um, if we have, let's say, a, a gene expression matrix, and that's an image, essentially, we've been looking at techniques from kind of image analysis. Um, let's say we're using convolutional neural networks or something similar. Um, and then um, some of these techniques around kind of saliency and calculating saliency over an image and um, so you might have seen examples where there's a picture of a, a bird and um, it lights up where the bird is in the background it's kind of um uh, it's not visible and you can you can see kind of why the the machine is making that decision we've been using similar techniques on some of these gene expression um images and and what's interesting is that um often the areas which are lighting up are actually um identifying genes or groups of genes which do have some um, common analysis with respect to the biological function. Um, so maybe that goes back to the previous question as well around kind of surprising results, because here we're not actually incorporating that prior knowledge, um, but, but, the, but it is giving us something which is um, somewhat more interpretable. Um, so it, it's maybe not quite so transparent as what you were referring to there, um, yeah. but I think it is, is an interesting step in that direction forward for us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. Well, it looks like we're right out of time. I just want to uh, quickly, um, you know, thank Cindy Crown and Shield for for inviting uh, uh, us to this uh, to my uh, to my co panelists uh, who who have a rich and interesting experience to share. Really appreciated those those talks, and to Allison for moderating as long as she could until her internet expired on her. So, uh, and thanks to everyone for joining the session. I, I hope it was interesting. Um, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks Thank you. Again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.